everyone in podcast listening land. I'm Karen Devaney. And I'm Ann Barner. And, and we're, we're sisters. sisters. Welcome to Sugarcoated Murder, where we'll discuss and probably inappropriately laugh about and comment on. Yep. One of our favorite subjects. Murder. murder. Oh, and we love to bake. And why not combine our two favorite subjects? Baking and killing. Hello, Heller. Heller. Heller and Barner. What you doing in the kitchen? Oh, girl. Well, you and I, before we started recording, went ahead and whipped up a French silk pie. Yes. For my boy's birthday. Happy birthday, boy. Yes, indeed. And so, um. Big 21. The big 21. Yes. Holy smokes, we're old. Oh, uh, no. We both have 21 year old boys. Well, just remember you got there first, so you must be older than me. Oh, but you have a 30 year old daughter, so. Oh, dang. Yeah. I forgot about that. I'm Shoot. still good. <laughs> mm. Wow, that hurt. Oh, my gosh, and guess what? Huh? Mama's in the house. Whoop, whoop. Mama in the house. Mama's here for a visit. We are, we are we have our mama here. She may or may not chime in. If anything, she'll just fuss at us. Oh yeah. But I can assure you there'll probably be no cussing today because mama's here and she'll smack me with a wooden spoon. We'll do our best. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, I am in your kitchen today baking oh, bourbon cream cheese brownies. I could not be more excited. Let me repeat myself. <laughs> Bourbon cream cheese brownies. It's like a trifecta. It is. It's like three of my favorite things. Oh, hell yeah. Especially because it starts with bourbon. I know. And thank God Mama brought a cookbook or else I we know. wouldn't have found this recipe. We found this recipe out of Mama's little um, cookbook binder that she has some hole punched recipes that she's pulled out of some magazines. This one came from Southern Living. It did? I think. I don't know. I It'll be at the think. bottom of the page. It ain't. Oh. Yep, Southern Living, December 2011. Wow. Yeah, so blast from the past, but nice. bourbon's always good. It's timeless. It is. It's true. So, <clears throat> whoo. Uh-oh. Please hold on. I must take a sip. You've become the clumped. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so just real quick, um, pretty easy recipe. You make a cream cheese mixture, and that's where the bourbon goes. And then you make a chocolate mixture, which is like your brownie mixture that's got all your brownie stuff in it, and, and it actually uses the baking squares and the butter. You melt them in the microwave till they're smooth. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm going to be adding like all the accoutrements to that, the eggs, the flour, the sugar, the brown sugar, the salt, the vanilla. And then you layer it in your pan. It says to put full in your pan and then spray the full. Right. But I'm using the tried and true Pampered Chef. Yes. Um, brownie Individual. pan. Yes. So we each I get, just buttered. We know that we each get the same size square. I know. It's the best. The only challenge that I can see is this is a 12 square pan and it says it makes um, 16. Oh, so but then some we of just, them will just be a little plumper or I'll just make plumper brownies. I'll or just, we'll just make four more after those are finished. Yeah, but we can figure it out. I don't care. But anyway, the most important part is the bourbon. Exactly. So um, that's what I'm doing in the kitchen. And what will you be doing? I'm going to be talking about murder. No way. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. So uh, just real quick before I forget, we've shouted out to our little niece, um, Tay Tay, yes. about the brownie pan. Well, it dawned on me today, and I don't know why it dawned on me, oh. but congratulations to... Taylor for making mom a great grandmother. Oh, yeah, that's right. I was the one that made her the grandmother first. Oh, so you'll take credit for that, but not the age part, but yeah. making her a grandma first. Yeah, I made her a grandmother first, and now Tay Tay has made her a great grandmother first. How so, sweet of whoop, her. Whoop. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, anyway, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's wonderful. I do too. Okay, so you uh, go go on with yourself. I'm right. going to be pouring bourbon into the cream cheese and ignore the slurping because okay. I might be drinking. Well, so. and I'm looking at, remember the mm -hmm. recipe called for a quarter of a cup, and I'm looking at your measuring thing. It's a little touch more than a quarter you know cup. What? It's an estimate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so my murder takes place in Ormond. Beach, Florida. Oh, I know where that Ormond is. Ormond Beach, right close to Daytona. Right close to where Sarah Daytona used to Beach, live. Yeah. My, my person. Yeah. They're my people. And this takes place in February of 1981. Okay. 
um, February 15th. So about this time in Florida, all the people are pouring in for the Daytona 500. Oh, yeah. That's so a big, it big is deal a, there. a really big deal. And they, oops, she's taking a sip out of the measuring cup. Okay, doke. Just making sure it's not stale. <laughs> It seems to be very good. So, it's a sunny day in February. People from all around are pouring into um, the area for the Daytona 500. Uh -huh. There's a couple out for a nice walk, and uh -huh. they discover a body uh -oh. on their walk. And those just hate that, to be out for a nice walk, on a path. Yeah, it's like the article I put out there where the jogger found the... The head. head. Oh my gosh. Like, I mean, I talk about ruining your jog. Really? Well, first of all, that's what she gets for jogging in the middle of the day. Right. right. I mean, that's why I'm against exercise outside. Well, and this is February in Florida, so the weather's probably Oh, that's true. Not the not weather's probably for beautiful for yeah. a walk. Unfortunately, they found the body of a 17-year-old girl. Oh, gosh. She had gunshot wounds to her back, and her pantyhose were next to her body. <coughs> were they legs? Because that's the only kind of pantyhose I remember. I think that's, that, I don't know. I, I would, I don't know. It didn't specifically say the type of pantyhose that there she There wasn't had. like a legs egg laying next to her? No, no, no. Okay. No. Okay. No, but because the pantyhose were next to her, they knew that she had been undressed and redressed. Yeah. So. Doesn't sound good. Um, that's not a good sign. No, I don't like it. So the couple calls the police. Um, the police get there. They send her the body to the medical examiner who determines that she had, in fact, been sexually assaulted and um, shot three times. Mm -hmm. She was identified as Diane Martland. Martland. Diane Martland. She had left home and not returned from a date. So, you know, Valentine's oh. Day, February 14th, she'd gone out on a big date. Well, it doesn't sound like it was a good date. And then she didn't come home. Right. So her family is, is frantically trying to find her. And then they get a call that Diane had been found murdered. Oh, I know. Stinks. So police then go in and they start tracing Diane's last steps before she left to go and meet her date. Mm -hmm. And her date is a 20-year-old guy. They never disclose his name, which I think is interesting because it is the first time I've done a murder where they've not disclosed any the name of a potential witness. That's weird. Maybe it's because he was a youngster. He's 20. Well, that goes, there goes my big Right. I just thought it was kind of interesting that they didn't tell us what his name was. I agree. They didn't show his face and I they didn't tell us his it. name. <laughs> I don't appreciate that at all. They protected the innocent, I suppose. So, well, if he's a suspect, yeah. he may or may not be the innocent. That's right. I've given it away. <laughs> so anyway, he says he, picks, he picked Diane up around 8 o'clock and they went off to a party. Mm -hmm. They left the party at 11. But as they left the party, they got involved to, involved in a road rage incident. Oh. Okay. And it got so bad that the other car actually hit this guy's car oh and then sped off. So Diane and the guy pull into his apartment complex, and he's, you know, angry and revved up about what happened. Diane's like, uh, dude, I'm just going to call the cab. So I'm guessing she made me not a good date. She's like, I'm yeah, out. She's you, like, I'm over this. You fix it. You figure it out. I'm, I got to go. So he's trying to tend to his situation. Mm -hmm. She's waiting for a cab in a, in a breezeway. He walks back into his apartment to get something. And when he comes back, she's gone. So he's assuming. She got the cab. And right. Um, but the detective said he was acting really, really strange. So they're thinking maybe he wasn't telling the truth about something no way right so they start to press him and they said well um on your date did you and diane have sexual relations and he said no and then they said do you know if she was wearing pantyhose the night of your date which i think is kind of a strange question right yeah why would she why have wouldn't any you pantyhose? Say, yeah why wouldn't you just say <laughs> do you remember what she was wearing and yeah. let him figure it and out. And then he said yes. And then he acted like he had made a big mistake and he shouldn't he shouldn't have said that. Like he had answered too quickly. And then he said, Well, I guess she's been raped. <gasps> right. Okay. Now the police had not given any details about what had happened to Diane to the public. 
Yeah. So they're thinking, what the heck is this guy, like, what is this guy doing here? Well, he's, he's acting a fool. So they go out and they call all of the cab companies in the area, and there had not been a pickup at this guy's apartment the night before. You mean he was less than honest? <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Get out of town with the less than honest. But they were able to verify that this guy had been into a hit and run. They looked at the damage on his vehicle. They were able to back up his story with witnesses around the apartment complex that he was there after, you know, Diane had had gone away. So he's been cleared. I don't like the way they cleared him. But, I don't think they've been very thorough. Right. Right, right. I mean, I'm just saying. I'm no <laughs> cop, but listen, that was not enough. I agree. That, I don't feel like they really... Thorough. Put the hammer down. But it was 1981, so maybe they have different tactics. Yeah, I think then. back then they were a little loosey-goosey with their tactics. Right. So detectives then start looking for the men who had been involved in the hit-and-run. And surprisingly enough, the driver of the hit-and-run um, vehicle actually came forward. What? And he said, um, yeah, it was me. We got into a tussle. It, you know, it was out of control. I saw that he was with the girl. Um, nobody got out of the car. I just sped away. So they then go off and deal with him, but he's cleared of any suspicious yeah, yeah. whatever. I think they cleared him too fast as well. Oh. So then they decide, okay, we're so going to... So they're just running around taking people's words for stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. So then the po so I keep saying so. I don't mean to do that. I'm going to try very hard not to say so anymore. You want me to hit you every time you say it? I don't. And then that no. way. That's what mama's job could be. Oh, don't. Don't. Don't hit me, mama. She's coming up behind me. <laughs> the police decide they're going to release as much information as they can to the public, hoping that somebody saw Diane somewhere. Yeah. And they can follow up on the information. A witness did come forward and said that she had seen Diane get into a pickup truck down the road from the apartments about a mile or so. And the witness gave a description of what Diane was wearing. So they knew, you know, that it was Diane that this lady had seen. She said she looked really out of place for the neighborhood. Oh. It, it was odd, you know, and she was visibly upset. Maybe most people don't wear pantyhose in that neighborhood. Right. And well, then she was like, what the heck? There's a pantyhose wearing If on? you look at the picture, she had on like a nice white pant suit type uh, she situation. Was for a nice day. Yeah, it was Valentine's Day. Oh, I'm just so sorry. Yeah. The witness said that Diane was very clearly upset and crying. She said the man driving the truck was a white male, 5'8 to 5'9, with a prominent nose and straggly long hair. Prominent? I don't know. How do you, like, I'm thinking prominent nose, but there's so many different shapes and sizes of noses. Yeah, like prominent with, how? Prominent right. flat and wide, prominent pointy, prominent right. with a big hump in it. Like, exactly. Like, we got all sorts of nose ch yeah. challenges now. They, um... She was able to sit with a sketch artist, though, and come up with a, a kind a of sketch a... Sketch artist. They, artists, I, am, I mean, that's grammar for you, but they are really talented. They are very talented. Very, very talented. I wouldn't be able to do it. Nah. <laughs> Pshaw. Right. Me neither. The problem is, and they release the sketch to the public, mm -hmm. and the police get thousands upon thousands of phone calls. Unfortunately, remember, this is... Daytona 500 season, so there are three times as many people, and the in the area, and they're overwhelmed with information coming in, oh, and sure. none of it seems to be working out. Working out. But then they get a call from police in Arthur, 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 Texas. Texas. Yeah. We went to Texas. All the way to Texas. And they said that they had a man fitting the description of the sketch. No way. That he had a history of violence and he had skipped bail after being charged with killing a girl with a 38 caliber pistol in Ohio. Oh, Ohio. I know. Come on, Ohio. Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> so, Diane had also been killed with a 38 caliber pistol. Oh, does this guy drive a truck? He does. 
Oh. He does. The night Diane was killed, he was near Daytona Beach, and he was driving a green pickup truck. The police then rush off to Texas to go question the guy. His name is Douglas Hammond. Okay. And when police talked to him, Doug said he wasn't their man. I know. He's, of course, I mean, I'm well, because it's murderers not do not lie. <laughs> no, I mean, they murder, but they're really they honest. They always tell the truth. <laughs> yes, very honest, especially when it comes to their involvement or lack thereof. Right. So he says, you know what? I was in Daytona Beach because mm-hmm. um, that's where my mom lives. But I left there before Diane was murdered and got a job working on an oil rig in Port Arthur, Texas. I So I, I couldn't have been the one. Easily enough, the police call up his former employer, say, this is the time we're looking at. The employer confirms Doug was on the oil rig. It could not have been Doug. So now we're back to square one. Don't you hate that? Yeah. All the investigation. And it's a year. Now we're like a year into this with no answers on what the heck happened to Diane. Mm. Almost a year to the day. I love it. Young, that stuff works. A young white female. Was she single? 27 year old married. Oh, so it's not a single white female. No, it's not a single white female. (laughs) She's found along the same path, walking path, where Diane was found. Oh, wow. So here we are a year Mm -hmm. later. It's Daytona 500 weekend again. And now we've got another dead body on the same walking path. And it's a woman. And she had been shot. And she had clearly been raped. Oh, dang. And she had been shot with 48 caliber caliber pistol. So the police are thinking, holy cow. We've got... Holy caliber. Holy caliber. We've got a situation. Yeah. We've got a dude, a serial killer. Somebody's out there doing bad things. Right. He's only showing up during the Daytona 500, though. Oh, well, maybe he's a race car driver. I don't know. Maybe. Oh my gosh, let's keep going and see if we can figure it out. Let's do! The police put out all the information they can on this this girl. Her name is Brenda Rucker. Mm-hmm. And they talked about where she was found, and they asked the public for any information that's out there. And the police get a tip from an inmate in a Florida jail. Mm-hmm. So, you know... Um, we're good. We're good to go. Oh, yeah. Here we right? go. Because it's an inmate in and jail. Mm-hmm. Right. He said he had information about Brenda's murder, and he pointed police in the direction of a man named Roy Swafford. Swafford. Swafford? Swafford. Roy. Roy? Roy. What have you been doing? Roy, what you doing? So the inmate and Roy had been at a campground when Brenda was murdered. Oh. In Ormond Beach. Uh-uh. The inmate said that Roy had been arrested the day after Brenda had been murdered for something other than the murder. But when they arrested him, the police had taken his gun, which was a 38 caliber pistol. They had taken that into evidence and didn't give it back. Oh, so they can just go find it. So that the inmate gun. said, You need to go check that gun. I'm pretty sure that's the gun he used to murder Brenda. For sure. The police then go to the evidence room, they find the gun, and lo and behold, it fits um, the exact caliber. No, what is it? It's the the ballistics. Yes, as the gun that killed Brenda. Okay. So now they've got old Roy on their radar. Radar Roy! They, They also go back and say, well, let's see if the ballistics aligned with Diane's murder. Oh, yeah. And they're 100% match. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. But the question is, is this inmate the person and he's pinning it on Roy? Right. Or is it Roy? Well, there's only one way to find out. And you're going to tell us? you got to find Roy. You do got to find Roy. Where are you at, Roy? Roy, where are you be? Roy's hiding in Tennessee. Nuh-uh. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you why Roy's in Tennessee. Because... His All his exes, exes were in Texas, so he had to go live in Tennessee. He, ha- he hanged his hat in Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I have a thing that's popped up on the computer screen I'd oh. like to talk about for just a sec okay. called 
Luke Filewalker. Okay, that's just some weird thing. You can just ignore it. Okay, it's scanning. It. It's scanning. It's fine. It's some stupid thing. Should I let it continue? Can it Luke can Filewalker scan. continue? Okay. Yeah, it can scan or you Nice can to meet you, Luke Filewalker. I don't understand it either. <laughs> So they find Roy in Tennessee, and they arrest him for Brenda's murder. Oh. But they didn't have enough evidence to get him on Diane's murder, oh. unfortunately. They take old Roy to trial. It took the jury three hours to find him guilty of Brenda's murder. Mm. And he was sentenced to death Ooh. in Florida. Okay. All right? So he's now a death row inmate. It's his it's it's his execution day. Oh, happy day it's day. Execution day for Roy. And you know Let me guess. He he has a come to Jesus moment and says it wasn't me. When you're <laughs> a death row inmate, your appeals um go right up until they yes. execute execute you. So there's always a possibility that you can get a stay of execution. Yes. Well, that happened to Roy just th just a couple of hours before he was set to be executed. The Florida Supreme Court gave him a stay of execution. Based on what? And a new court date based on forensic analysis that put doubt on whether or not he had raped Brenda. Oh. So he was convicted for murder and rape. Oh. And they're saying, and remember, this is now, what, 1982, yeah. 83, maybe? So the DNA stuff isn't no. huge at this point. No, we're nowhere close. Um, they, so Roy then gets his stay of execution, and they give him a new court date. You know, a new court date is going to be years down the line. Yeah. But this actually gives the police an opportunity to go back into Diane's cold case. Okay. And they can pull some of the evidence from her file. DNA is now starting to make a big scene. It's come on scene. They're starting to use it more and more. And the police say, you know what? We've got DNA from that case. Let's just send it off and see what happens. So they pull the DNA testing from Brenda and from Diane, and they send it off to see if anything comes back. Mm -hmm. Well, Roy's DNA was a 100% match to that found on Diane. Okay, you little rascal. Now you get to die. Right. Now they've got enough proof that Roy killed Diane to take him to trial for Diane's murder. Hmm. So now they've got him for Brenda and, and Diane. Diane. Right. So we really are going to, we're really going to execute you. So Roy knew he'd been caught. Caught right like, Damn it. I I'm caught. It. Yeah. Um, he pled guilty to Diane's murder and to Brenda's murder in exchange for oh. life in prison without the possibility yeah, of parole. I don't think that that's fair. He did get two life sentences with no parole, and they are to be served consecutively. Oh, I like that. I like consecutive. Yeah. Consecutive is the good one. Yeah. I like that. I know. Very I was very much. happy to see that. So there is absolutely no chance at all that Roy is going to be getting out of jail. I wonder where he is. Somewhere in Florida. I, I could probably figure that out but for let's you. Let's go tease him and throw baloney at him or something. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. He is in, oh, let's see, he was in Volu. Volusa County mm -hmm. is where he was. It doesn't tell me where he's being held. Okay. But I will tell you the story of what happened. Okay. During the early morning hours, Roy and a bunch of his friends drove from Nashville to Daytona Beach. They planned to camp at a state park mm -hmm. to attend the Daytona 500 race. Mm -hmm. Roy and his friends went out to a bar called the Shingle Shack. Well, nobody needs to be going there. They're going to I get know. shingles. I, I wouldn't have gone there. On the evening of the 13th of February, mm -hmm. they returned to the campground, campground around midnight. Mm -hmm. Then Roy went out again and did not return until Sunday morning. 
a dancer from the Shingle Shack oh, testified I see what kind of place we're going to. that Roy had returned to the bar that night around 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, she left the bar with Roy when she got off work at 3 o'clock in the morning, and the two of them spent the rest of the night together at the house of one of Roy's oh, friends. Talking about science projects and things? Right. Yeah. The dancer testified that Roy returned her to the Shingle Shack, Shingle Shack at 6 o'clock on Sunday morning. Roy then reportedly drove from the Shingle Shack back to the campground, a route that would have taken him by the gas station where he, where Brenda, Brenda was abducted from a gas station. Okay. On the morning of February 14th, this is for Brenda's murder. Okay. Brenda was working at the gas station, and two witnesses placed Roy at Brenda at the scene before 6.20 in the morning. A third witness arrived at the gas station at a few minutes after 6.20 in the morning and found the store open, the lights on, but no attendant on duty. Uh. And that's when they called the police, mm -hmm. the witness. On February 15th, Brenda's body was discovered a few miles from the gas station in a wooded area. The medical examiner determined the cause of death to be blood loss from a gunshot wound to the chest. So she wasn't killed instantly. She bled out. Brenda had been shot nine times, oh my with two of the shots being to the head. Medical examiners also determined from the semen found on her body that she had been sexually assaulted and examining the type of gun they found it to be a 38 caliber gun they were able to line the ballistics up so there was no doubt he actually had reloaded his gun at least oh, one time during the shooting stop it and then after the day 10 of 500 Roy and his friends went back to, went back to the shingle shack one of the members of the group got into a fight with some other people after he got swindled on a drug deal. Oh. And Roy pulled a gun, and that's when he got arrested. Oh. Yeah. So this girl, the, the, the dancer from the Shingle Shack, needs to be counting her blessings, blessings that she was not the one that got killed. Because he left her and went and got Brenda and killed her. Mm -hmm. So... That's what I got. Roy Swafford, you dirty, rotten scoundrel. He's a jerkwad. A jerkwad. Okay. Daytona Beach. So Daytona lessons, learned lessons learned on this brownie recipe. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant on my murder. because No, we have lessons learned on that too. But because you have to layer it and then swirl it, uh -huh. not a good fit for the individual brownie pan. Oh. So I'm just going to say it is what it is and it's going to taste real good, but it may not look real good. Oh, we don't care about how it looks. Listen, our listeners can't see it. They do when we put a picture up. Girl. What happens if we don't put a picture up? I don't know. Or we find a picture of a beautifully swirled <laughs> brownie and put that up instead. <laughs> I could draw one better than you. And I think our listeners now. know us by now. Yeah. We are so far from perfect. We are not perfect. Uh, we're not professional bankers. If I were perfect, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. Exactly. Well, show me you a coven in chocolate. Your I'm, arms have chocolate everywhere. I'm telling you, <laughs> it's been a wild ride. You are having a good time over there. I can tell you one thing. <laughs> that cream cheese bourbon stuff, I could drink with a straw. Mm, a mm -hmm, straw. Mm. Okay, I'm just going to. So now that you've swirled all your stuff, what happens? I'm putting it in a damn oven. All right. So you're going to cook. While it's cooking, you're going to. Tell me a murder? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a murder. One heck of a murder. <laughs> Mama, tell me a murder story. <laughs> All right, we, we never go. got that growing up. No. We I got didn't Peter have Pan. to. No, I got we had Peter. it happening all around town. I got Peter Pan when I was growing up. I loved to listen to Peter Pan. I think so much that Dad eventually <laughs> recorded it on a tape recorder. <laughs> he just let me listen to Probably. it at night. All right, so this goes in for 40 to 45 minutes, but I'm going to actually back it down because they're individual. Okay. So I'm going to put it at like maybe 33. All right. And then we'll take it from there. All right, well, I'm going to pause this for a little break. I'm going to get some more water. Then I and we'll need switch. to wash all the chocolate off of me. Yes, you need to 
to get yourself together. And we'll be back. Bye. Please, I so. mean, hold on. All right, we're back. Okay, good. Good to know. I think I've gotten most of the chocolate off of me. I don't know. It's on my shirt everywhere. I look like I've gone through a car wash that sprayed chocolate. I'd like to go to that car wash. <laughs> me too. <laughs> okay, sugar. Well, the brownies are in the oven. So when they go off, you're going to have to check them. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I'll check them. Okay. I was about to take my book out like I was going to talk about it more. <laughs> well, maybe bit. you want to take notes on this one. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> So, it's like a business meeting or something. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about a girl named Jennifer. Do you want to drink some bourbon? Because I feel like we're kind of flat. Like, yeah, there's not a bourbon. Flat. As long as I don't have well, to. Well, I have to get up and fix it? Yeah, because I'll be talking. For heaven's sake. You don't want to have to go on pause again, do you? No. But no. I don't want to have to get up again. My God, I've gotten your water, your phone. I mean, what else? The two things that were just laying right there on the counter, like right there. It's exhausting. You passed right by it. Exhausting. Mm -hmm. Mom, oh. are you going to take a swig of bourbon? I thought you wanted a swig. Oh, there you go. I like it in a highball glass with a lot of ice, please. Oh, my. See? Do you know where the, the coffee maker is? They're in the cabinet above the coffee maker on the second shelf up. All the, all the way to the left on the second shelf up. Is a little short glass. That's there you the go. One. And you fill it up with ice. Oh, okay. Are you having some? Oh, no. I've got to drive. One of us is going to have to drive today. That's not going to be me if I'm drinking this bourbon. <laughs> I mean, does Cameron really need birthday cards? <laughs> or or does he need wrapping paper? I mean, how big is the thing you're wrapping? Oh, I've got several things. So, um, I mean... How do you feel about Christmas wrapping paper? I'm fine with it. He actually would love that. Yeah. Well, where so, are we going to go get the, the card? The Dollar Tree? Yeah. Okay. I got wrapping paper. I know, but we were thinking about whether or not we were driving. Yeah, I'm just saying, I think we can have construction paper. Can we we can make card? him a card. Which I have he cards. Buy. I just don't have envelopes. He doesn't need an envelope. Okay. We'll just put a sticky note on it. <laughs> Listen, Mama said the ice. <laughs> Do you have any ginger ale? I do. Okay. Get over there and help mom make that drink. I can do it. For heaven's sake. Where is your ginger ale? It's on the door of my refrigerator. Okay. Should we pause? No, <laughs> should we, we pause? Should pause again. Sorry, oh my gosh. It's drink time. We, we've decided to have a little mid morning drink, so please hold. All right, now I have my drink. All right. Mama Mama's has got a drink. A Karen's got drink. a drink. I've got to drive later, so I'm having ginger ale. Yeah. Yes, we're having a little morning drink, and then we're going to have a morning nap. <laughs> <laughs> so, anywho. All right. I'm going to talk about a girl named Jennifer. All right. Back in 1992, in September of 92, she was 19 years old, and she was late. She was she, late. She like, was late. She had missed her period late. Can you listen to the story or, and stop? You stop and you pause. You said she was late. That was period. a dramatic pause. Oh, well, then I had a question. <laughs> late for what? She was scheduled to work the 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift at the local hospital. So what you could have said was she was late for work. I didn't want to. Girls. <laughs> See? That's See? enough. I'm going to sip this bourbon okay, in a minute and then we'll throw the glass at her. We're, not, we're taking an Uber. I'm getting a drink. Oh, that's good. Okay, so um, this is in Cathedral City, California. She was late for her 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift at the local hospital. It was 9.50 p.m. and she had missed her bus. Can I ask a question? Oh, never mind. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> she had missed her bus because she had, to, she had stopped by to, to... You've got me all clipped. She, she stopped by, no, she didn't. She has stopped to buy, <laughs> she stopped to buy some flipping candy. Okay. Because there were a couple of disabled girls that she worked with and she liked to take them candy. That's nice, She's Jennifer. a sweet, sweet lady at 19. So, a man, just a plain, ordinary man, mm -hmm. sees her at the empty bus stop, mm -hmm. puts two and two together, and thinks she must need a ride. Oh, no. So he rolls down his car window and offers her a ride. And at first, she says, no, thank you. But before he drives away, 
she changes her mind and sa- says, yeah, I'd, I'd like that. I'd like that ride. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Jennifer. So it was a quiet ride to the hospital. And she remembers him mumbling some awkward stuff, but it was not enough to frighten her or alarm her. I wonder what kind of candy she brought. Like, was it, it didn't a chocolate say, I or felt like it was a maple nut goodie because that's what like I was that. craving when I was <laughs> doing this. But I was so, do y'all miss the candy, like the round balls? It was probably penny color. candy. Oh, God, I really yeah, miss that. I candy. like some penny candy. Okay, so rude. And so. Nothing alarmed her or frightened her about the guy. Okay. Okay. So, as he drops her off at the hospital, he asks for her number. And she... Jenny, can I get your number? number. Well, she rattled off a fake phone number. Was it 8675309? I'm pretty sure that's the exact (laughs) one. And then somebody wrote a song about it. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my God. Is this the song? Yeah. Oh, I've given it away. Absolutely. I'm so sorry. sorry, everybody. It's the end of the podcast now. <laughs> we're gonna uh, we're gonna shut this whole entire podcast down, and from now on, we're just gonna read nursery rhymes. <laughs> That's it. You're not doing this anymore. Okay. So <sighs> she hops out of the car and over her shoulder just rattles off a fake number and goes to work. Right. So she works her 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift, and as she walks out of the hospital, there's the man that gave her the ride. Oh. Waiting in the parking lot. Sure. Yeah, but I take you back to the bus stop. And so. How he, kind. He seemed like he had been waiting there, there for eight hours. She worked an eight hour shift. Oh, like he, you think he sat there and didn't. And it just seemed like he was still waiting in the same spot. Right, right. So, um, she decides that she's just going to turn around and walk down the street. Right. And as she's walking down the street. She could hear him coming up behind her in the car. Oh, dear. She could hear the sound of his car slowly following, creeping along, gravel crunching, motor almost in an idle because he's going so slow because she's walking slow. And she's just like, I'm just going to just look ahead right. and just keep walking. Like, I don't see him. I don't see him in that big car. So the man pulls ahead, just ahead of her and stops. And he gets out and says, hey, you want to go grab breakfast? (laughs) And she said, no, I'm fine. I don't don't need breakfast. And then he offers to take her back to the spot where he picked her up that night before her shift. And she thought, well, I mean, I got here and I'm alive. So I'm sure he's going to, he's fine. So she says, yeah, you can take me back to where you picked me up. Well, as soon as Jennifer gets in the car and the driver pulls away, she knew she had made a huge mistake. You think? Yes. The driver immediately brings up the phone number she had given him and lets her know that he knows it's fake. Oh, no. Yeah. Now he's mad. He becomes enraged. Oh, he gosh. reaches past, he he reaches across, grabs her hands, and binds them. Oh, no. And then he drives past the spot where he was supposed to let her out. Oh, gosh. I can't imagine what she right. must be thinking. And she's... She's thinking, I, I'm, this is not good. I'm probably not going to make this. I'm not going to make it alive. Trout, we're busy. Trout, don't look all innocent with that toy sticking out of your mouth. So, oh, no. he drives past the spot where she was supposed to get out, and he drives her up to a deserted area. Oh. He forces her out of the car and gags her and then attempts to rape her. Right. He is unsuccessful right. at raping her. It so happens, it happens. It happens, but it still matters. And so up until then, she had been begging him to spare her life. Right. Begging him. Yeah. She, he gets so mad because he can't rape her that he starts to beat her again, oh. and he strangles her, and she blacks out. Okay. When she comes to, he is yet again attempting to rape her. Oh, God. Unsuccessfully. Right. He's pissed. Right. So this time, she knows that she's going to die, and she's tired of begging for her life. So she looks at him and says, you know what? Just shoot me. Just oh. shoot me and kill me now. Uh, right. I'm good. Yeah, I might, I might say the same thing. So as she does that, it's almost like her attacker changes his mind, mm-hmm. and he's, he doesn't shoot her. Well, instead, he drags her, bruised bound, half-naked from the waist down, across the dirt, over gravel, 
over some cacti uh -oh. and throws her, binds her up, bundles her up and throws her in the trunk of his car. Right. So she's thinking, okay, so now I'm in the trunk of this car. Now I'm going to another location. Things are not looking good for me. And in 1992, they didn't have the little thing that you could pull in the trunk to get out. Right. But she says it was divine intervention. Somehow that dark trunk became illuminated enough for her to find the latch. Oh. She was able to wiggle and wiggle and wiggle and work those bindings off of her wrists enough to be able to get to the latch and pull that trunk. Right. So she waits until she feels the car slow down. Mm -hmm. She pops that trunk and gets out, falls out of the trunk, gets up barefooted, half naked, bound, gagged, and starts running down the street. Oh. He stops. He jumps out with this huge knife, and he is chasing her down the street. Oh, my God. And like she is screaming movie. for her life. Lord have mercy. She's, I know. It gives me chills. She finally flags down a car, and they stop. Mm -hmm. And she jumps into the car, and they're able to go and take her to some EMTs that start to help her. And then she finds her way to the police station. Right. Okay. So she goes and reports her crime to the police officers. Um, she's had a horrible horrible ordeal yes my god and the police officers don't believe her what are you saying right this minute i'm saying <laughs> they don't take her story seriously what they file the report but they don't really put a lot of merit against it oh, so they don't lord. really look for her attacker mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so she also returns home and her mother who had been a pretty abusive mother to begin with um, simply tells her, this would not have happened to you if you had not been hitchhiking. Are you kidding? No. So her mother gives her no support. Oh, my God. So she has nobody that's supporting her. She's 19 years old. She's had the she's, crap beat out of her. She's been almost raped twice. She's right. been drugged through cacti. Right. Put in a trunk, and she has had the will to fight and survive. For what? For no comfort. Right. For no empathy, no compassion. The cops don't believe her. Her mom doesn't give a crap. What's your language? <laughs> I got it. I caught myself, Mama. So anyway, um, she really goes through it. And she so now she has to overcome this ordeal by herself. Right. Okay. She's been victimized. Yeah. She's got nobody to help her. And for years, she lives in terror that this man yes. is going to come back and find her. Right. Oh my gosh, she I wish she had been my friend. I know. She suffers hard. Some people even start referring to her as, oh, that's the kidnapped girl. What? Yes. They're not compassionate towards her at all. That it's is the very craziest thing. So for years, she lives with PTSD in a time where PTSD isn't even a thing. Yeah. Right? They have not identified. Sure. There's no treatment. Yeah, back in the 90s. She is in and out of mental health facilities. Oh, all God. Them. Like she's really suffering. Um, she even starts cutting herself in the very spot where the bindings were. Right. Because she wants to keep the wounds open because it's a release for her anxiety. Right. But it, she said it also gave her a chance that when people would see those open cuts, they would ask her what happened, and then she would be able to tell her story. Right. It was the only way she could get any release. Sure. Some people believed her. Some people didn't. Some people sidestepped and walked away. Right. So it was very sad what she was living through. So she's in a mental health facility. She's on and off all sorts of mental health medications right. for her PTSD and, and her anxiety, her depression, her cutting, you know, attempted suicide, even though she says it wasn't suicide. So um, at times she even starts to question herself. Yeah, I'm sure. To think, Did this really happen to right. me? I mean, she's really losing her I would be the mind. same way. I would if I didn't get any support from anybody, not even the police, yes, not even my own mother, I would be like, right. did I dream this? Is so this she's in and out of this mental hospital, and there is a um, an orderly type person who befriends her. Okay. She calls him her black angel. All right. And he starts to talk to her and say, look around these people. All of these people came in almost normal. Mm -hmm. The drugs that they are on are altering who they are. They cannot function and you're better than that. Right. And I want you to work really hard on getting off this medication sure. and getting yourself together. Right. 
So something about what he says triggers her and she starts to feel stronger and she's like, I'm going to try to figure out how to survive this. Right. So that's what she's working on. But it's not easy. I mean, this is a young girl. Sure. So five years go by. Okay. April of 1997, a man named Andrew, I'm going to screw his name up and I don't care. Your Dialis. Okay. Erdialis. All right. Your Dialis, my Dialis, your Dialis, Erdialis, your Dialis. <laughs> he was arrested in connection to some ongoing murder cases. Mm -hmm. And as and so they send his gun off for ballistics and, and they're holding him. And as they're waiting for the ballistics to come back, he confesses to eight murders mm. and one that got away. <gasps> oh, Jennifer was the one that got away. Yeah. So he starts talking to them and they figure out this. They got to figure, they got to go uh -oh. talk to. This is a reminder. Sorry. Stretch. It's 1230. It's time to stretch. Telling everybody, everybody to the stretch. Up, stretch. Up, up, down, touch, touch the ground. ground. Up, down. Okay. This is a reminder. She tells you twice. She does because she thinks the first yeah. time you're like, who said that? Right. So okay. we're good. We're past that. We've stretched. Moving on. So Jennifer is the one that got away. So she's contacted by police, and she is able to identify her attacker through a photo lineup. Wow. Right. This girl has really suffered. I mean, I'd be like, her sister, put my face on national television because I told you so. Exactly. I told well, you and so. she had suffered so much. She would even go out, like, on double dates with friends mm -hmm. like with, and with her sister, and her sister would try to tell her, please act normal. Please try to act normal. That's when you're exactly on your date. what my sister would have done. I would have been like, Shelga, you're embarrassing me. Yeah. So one time she was on a date and she was they were she and her date were in the back seat, her sister and the guy that were driving somewhere, right. and she was mumbling uh -huh. something. And the guy said, What are you mumbling? And she said, I'm memorizing license plates because I know this man's license plate and I just need to find out where he is. Right. And she said, do you have a pen and paper? And he was like, I'm done with this date. Right. <laughs> yeah. So this girl's really suffering. So anyway, we're going to talk about who this Andrew Erdialis is. Okay? Okay. So little is known about Andrew and his childhood. But in June of 1977, shortly before his 13th birthday, he beat the family dog to death with a baseball bat. Excuse me? Told his parents the animal had fallen. Oh, my gosh. Um, but he successfully completed high school in Illinois, and then he joined the United States Marines. Mm -hmm. Between 84 and 91, he was sta stationed at Camp Pendleton in California. Right. He completed combat training, which he then used to kill women. Right. Nice. He was trained as a radio operator at the Marine Corps Base 29 Palms, and he also served in Desert Storm. Mm. He committed his first murder on the evening of January 18, 1986. It was at a college in Mission Vallejo, California. Mm -hmm. He stalked a 23-year-old communication art student. Her name was Robin Bradley, and then he stabbed her 41 times with the knife. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Two years later, in 1988, he shot a 29-year-old sex worker named Julie McGee with a 45 caliber pistol. Mm. He, um, Her body was found in a ditch near Cathedral City, California. Right. That's where Jennifer was. Right. So, two months later, he struck in San Diego. He killed a 31-year-old sex worker named Mary Ann Wells, whose body was found in 1988 in an abandoned warehouse. Mm. His fourth victim was Tammy Irwin. She was found on the streets of Palm Springs in 1989. 1991, he is honorably discharged from the Marines. Because of? Because it's time for him to get out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he moved back to his parents' home in Chicago. Oh, in September 1982, he returned to California for a holiday, and that's when he kidnapped Jennifer, Ugh. and her last name is Aspenson. Aspenson. Let me go on holiday and kill some more people. Well, I mean, isn't that how you go on holiday? <laughs> yes. As yes. a matter of fact, it is. So he confessed that he tied her hands and attempted to, rip, to rape her, but was unable to perform. 
So he beat her and put her in the trunk of his car, and the woman was able to jump out of the car and escape. She ran down the highway naked from the waist down with her hands bound. He chased her down the highway with a large knife, but she was able to flag a car down. And so then he escaped in his own vehicle. Does wow. that sound familiar? It sounds like you're reading her police report. Exactly. When nobody believed her. That's crazy. Yes. So for three years, he didn't commit any more murders after Jennifer escaped because he thought for sure they were going to come get him. So he's on the lay low. He's laying low. So he returned to California in March of 1995, and he happened, he stumbled upon a 32 year old sex worker named Denise Maney, mm -hmm. also in Cathedral City, California. Wow. He forced her into his car, drove her into the desert, which is what he did with Jennifer. Right. There, he shot her, undressed her, and left her corpse for the scavengers. Wow. Nice. So he could believe that he could just as easily commit murders in Illinois and the surrounding area. So as a security guard in a Chicago mall, oh my gosh. he gained the trust of a lot of customers in this family environment. Mm -hmm. So he would cross the line into Bloomington, Indiana. He murdered a girl named Laura there, but her body was found in Wolf Lake, Illinois. So he was crossing borders. He would, he would murder a person, cross the border, dump the body, murder. Like he was jumping the border. Right. So... And, yes, okay. So, in 1996, police found the body of 21-year-old Cassandra Corum in the Vermilion River Mountains in Livingston County, Illinois. So, this guy is just doing He's, whatever right, he wants. Right. And then, in 1996, the body of Lynn Huber was found also in Wolf Lake. So, we've got two in Wolf Lake. And... She is presumed to be his last victim. In 96, he was arrested for possession of an unlicensed weapon, uh -huh. but he paid a fine and was released. Wow. So in 97, he was arrested because they wanted to check his gun and the connection of these ongoing murders right. going around. And that's when the ballistics were out and he confessed. Wow. So... Um, in April of 97, an indictment was brought against him, and then it became a political debate. Uh, what do you mean? Should he be punished with the death penalty in uh, Illinois? Yeah. Well, um, they were trying it at that time. They were trying to abolish the death penalty. Okay. So in April of 2001, the prosecutor decided to request the death penalty anyway. Because he's like, the guy needs to go to trial. I'm going to request the death penalty. If, but I'm going to give them the option of not giving him the death penalty. Right. So, um, and there was this ongoing debate, and the governor was involved. At the time, his name was George Ryan. Um, there had been some studies done at Northwestern that concluded that some of the death row inmates were innocent, and some death row in inmates were put to death, and they were innocent found to be innocent later. So there was just, you know, there was just a lot of brouhaha. It, it got tied up in the political arena. And therefore, he he had, so he had gone to trial. They gave him the death penalty, but then his death sentence was commuted because they abolished the death penalty in, in Illinois. Right. So then there, the prosecution started to prepare the... Um, the affidavits and the indictments on the Cassandra Cora murder. Mm -hmm. And that was in 2004. And at that point, Er Dialis decided that he would plead guilty, but claim he was mentally ill. Oh my gosh. Right. And so the judge resentenced him to death oh. from the previous one and then gave him a second death sentence. Oh, okay. So now he's got two. Yeah, but then the governor in 2011, Pat Quinn, signed into law abolishing the death penalty. So now his two death penalty cases have been, he's been resentenced to life in prison. For heaven's sake. Yes. They can't get it together. Yes. So then California starts to take a crack at it because they've got all these murders from when he was stationed in the Marines. Well, I wondered if the military would get involved. I don't think so. I don't think they got involved only because he was out of the Marines by the time he was picked up. Right. 
So if he was active duty, they, they would have probably gotten involved. But And none of these happened on the bases where okay. he was stationed. Right. So in 2018, he is convicted of five Southern California murders of women. Wow. And the... In 2018, the jury recommended the death penalty in California. That's unheard of. Yeah. Unheard of. They only deliberated for one day. Right. He was again sentenced to death for a third time. Okay. So. Please tell me this guy is dead. On November 2nd, 2018, around 11.15, he is in San Quentin Prison. And he is in his cell at the, it's called the, we don't call it prison. We call it the Adjustment Center. Really? Of San Quentin Prison. I don't know. What's the Adjustment Center? Go get your crap together? I don't know. It's Stop jail. murdering prison. people. It's prison. Anyway, he could, he committed suicide. Oh, okay. And I'm going to tell you why he probably did, because he couldn't figure out if he was on death row or not. He's I mean, like, like, I'll do I, it. I'll just do it, because y'all are arguing. So okay. anyway... So that's who he was. But what I want to tell you is who Jennifer is. Okay. Jennifer Aspenson. She is the sole survivor of this serial killer. She is a warrior. And she actually has, amongst all the cutting scars on her arm, mm -hmm. she had tattooed the word warrior. Oh, So now nice. she can remember that those scars are because she's a warrior. Yeah. She didn't just escape from him. Right. She also survived living with PTSD with absolutely no help from the mental health community, from her family, or from the police. Right. So she is a warrior. Yeah. She is. And she has written a book. God. It's called The Girl in the Treehouse. And she, so when she found out that this guy had been arrested and that he had eight other victims. Mm -hmm. She asked the police that she to please ha give the victims her name and her contact information because she wanted to bond with them. Right. Only to find out that there were none of them that survived. Right. And so she dedicated that book to those eight victims. Good for her. I know. That's she's, amazing. she's an amazing person. So um And what's the name again? The girl in the tree the house. The girl in the tree house. And it's not really it's it's about it does involve the attack. Well, sure. I'm sure that, that like, how she survived. Well, even and, her childhood. Sure. her childhood, she said her childhood is what led her to being kidnapped. Yeah, I'm sure. Because she actually was raised by parents who were a little goofy. Right. Her dad had built, built this geodesic dome oh, for gosh. them to live in as oh. children. They had no electricity and no running water. Oh, my. And a lot of times they had no food. Oh, dear. So she, you know, they were just kind of... They existed. Right. So there was no, she was very naive. Right. She had no television. She had no rate. She had no outlets right. except for education. Sure. And that was sporadic. So she was very trusting of people. She was very naive. She had, she had never heard of people getting murdered or people getting raped or she just was so sheltered. Yeah. And because she had a physically and mentally abusive mom. She said that also led to her wanting, always trying to connect to people and didn't mm -hmm. want people, she wanted to not piss people off. Sure. So Which that was the she whole. she accepted the ride. Yeah, because she, she felt wrong. bad. She felt bad because she had given him this number that was fake. And then, you know, she doesn't want to go to breakfast with him, but I'm, I don't want him to feel so rejected. So I'll let him take me back to where I was. So she said that's who she was. And so that led her to being in those circumstances. Right. My goodness. And she also thinks because she had lived off the land and had really been a survivor of her childhood, she was able to survive and think for herself and get out of the situation with him. Yeah. So she's a she's um she's a badass. She is a she's badass. a badass. Ass. <laughs> ass. She's a badass. I mean you gotta admit, Mama, she's a badass. There's just no other word for her. So that's the story of Jennifer Absent Ab Absent Ass Benson. Oh my god. It's the bourbon. Is that what it is? The bourbon twists my little tongue around like a candy cane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's she getting out the brownies. Hold your liquor back. <laughs> my liver's not the one talking. But I'm already done with mine and mine was double what it was yours. So I forget to <gasps> I think that's my issue. Which is funny because you, you 
define yourself as a casual sipper. I am so a, I'm a bourbon sipper. You're not a sipper, you're a drinker. Well, I think it's because I'm talking and I'm just not paying attention to what I'm doing. Okay. If I were just sitting and watching That's really the good news, your brownies are done. It doesn't look too bad. They I look, look great. It doesn't look They're wonky. cute, yeah. Yeah. So three fourths if you want to taste it, Mom. You can or not. You don't want it? She don't want it. I understand. Oh, I hope I taste the bourbon. I probably won't be able to taste the bourbon because I already have bourbon in my mouth. I'll let you know if it's if it's. Oh, it tasty. smells real good. You see if it got cooked. Oh, yeah, these are really good. Mm. Good looking. Mm. Mm. Hot. That's good. Mm. Can you taste the bourbon? Hang on. Mm. My mouth is on fire. Mm. Mm hmm You can? Mm hmm Because all I taste right now is bourbon mm -hmm. and chocolate, and I don't know where it's coming from. Oh, it's really, really yummy. It is a very good brownie. Guys, so y'all got to try this. It's not an overwhelming bourbon. Not at all. It's just a flavor. It, uh, I think it's a flavor enhancer to enhances the chocolate. Enhances the chocolate, yeah. Very, very good. Well done. Thank you, Shogun. All right, look at us. We did look another one. Oh, oh, my gosh. Another, okay, one the another one in the books? Yeah. Okay, well, we have social media. Yes, we do. We've got email. What is that address? Um, Murder dot sugarcoated at gmail.com mm -hmm. so you can email us we we'll, love to hear from you we do just we don't me. even care what you say it's i mean don't be way. ugly to us or yeah. anything or hurt our feelings but i mean just some chit chat i'm good with that we yeah. don't need email pen pals karen takes care of all of our social media so we've got a facebook fan page yes we do um, and that's where we actually um last week we put the sound check on there from, yeah. <laughs> from when we set up because it's pretty we pretty much are silly when we're sound checking right every time so we started putting the sound checks on the fan page if y'all want to go on there yeah and we do some other stuff on the fan page that we don't necessarily do other places and then we've got an instagram mm. at sugarcoated murder yeah that's become very popular yes and we have a web page we have a web page sugar coated pod sugarcoated pod.com yes dot com and we have a regular facebook page that's not a fan page it's just open to the public right but if you want to be a fan look up our fan page and request to join because yeah. we got a lot of people in there yeah we've, the had, time. we've had a couple newbies this week we have we have people still want to join our fan page which i is love so it perplexing to me. <laughs> it's just amazing that we still have listeners mm -hmm. we really appreciate it guys all right, well, it's the start of the weekend for us. Woo! So bourbon, cheers. bourbon it up, guys. Cheers bourbon to it everyone. up. Cheers to y'all, y'all. Stay sweet. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe. And we love you. We do love you. And stay tuned because we've got a great shorty coming. Oh, my be, gosh, which is going to be our, our mama. We're going to have a shorty with our mama. Yes. She's going to be making some key lime pie. Oh, y'all just, just should be here to taste this stuff. Bye, y'all. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.